Haas factory team is close to announcing their 2025 NASCAR Xfinity Series driver lineup. Kurt Busch was unfortunately arrested, and RFK Racing is the new favorite to pick up the Kroger sponsorship for 2025. What's going, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to your video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them those really quickly. We first got a couple paint schemes to take a look at. Let's jump into those really quickly. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jeremy Columbus 2024 Mark Martin throwback scheme that we'll see at Atlanta Motor Speedway. This is a throwback to Mark Martin's 1998 and 1999 Vaveline schemes. I like this a lot. Jeremy Clemens has some really good looking sponsors here. This one's no exception. It looks amazing, looks incredible, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Atlanta. And the last paint scheme we're taking a look at is John Hunter Nemechek's 2024 Mobile One scheme that we'll see this weekend at Michigan. I don't think he can make a Mobile One Pegasus scheme look bad, honestly. I think this looks amazing. I love the black number. I like the white. The Pegasus looks great, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack. It looks amazing and pretty freaking incredible. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Michigan purses. So every time you have a NASCAR Cup, Xfinity Series, and Truck Series race, Bob Pox put out the purse money for the event. And according to Bob for the Cup race, it's $7,902,750. And for the Xfinity race, it's $1,367,917. Some decent money for the NASCAR Xfinity Series race, but for the Cup Series, that's some pretty good purse money. Granted, that's with all the charter money, among other things. So that's why the money is a little bit up all things considered so that's some pretty good money for this weekend at michigan and the xfinity money also is pretty good in my honest opinion and now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we unfortunately have to take this episode to a sour note as unfortunately unfortunately was confirmed that roy mccallie sadly passed away Roy McCallie, for those who do not know, was a crew chief for Team Penske for many years in the 2000s, won a ton of race in 2005 in the NASCAR Xfinity Series with Ryan Newman, also, of course, won the Daytona 500 in 2008, and also had a lot of success with Team Penske with Kurt Busch as well. My prayers and condolences do go out to the McCallie family, and my prayers and condolences also go out to Team Penske. Roy McCallie, unfortunately, was just 53 years old. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the best average finishes of the last five races. Now, Trey Ryan, who does a lot of really good stat booking, put out a big interesting stat in regards to the top 10 best drivers with the la in the last five races in regards to the average finishes. And according to Trey Ryan, here are the top 10 best average finishes. So Tyler Reddick has the best with a 3.2. Ryan Blaney has a 6.2. Bubba Wallace has a 7.8. Daniel Suarez has a 13.4. Same with Chase Elliott has a 13.4. Kyle Larson has a 13.6. Chris Buescher has a 15.2. Alex Bowman and Carson Osmar both have 15.4s. And Denny Hamill has a 15.6. Some of the biggest surprises to me, Daniel Suarez has a fourth best average finish the last five races. It basically, of course, comes from that Richmond race where he was very, very quick. But the biggest surprise to me is the fact that Danny Hamill, despite all the issues, he still got a 15.6 average finish, which isn't completely horrible. But seeing Tyler Reddick, that doesn't surprise me. He's had six straight top six finishes. It's been one of the best stretches we've seen. I think they noted that it's the first time since 2021 that we've seen someone have six straight top six finishes which is absolutely incredible. And just seeing these numbers is phenomenal. You got 10 of the best drivers in the field. Carson knows for having the ninth best average finish, I think is honestly incredible. And I think some of these average finishes are pretty awesome and pretty great to see overall, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Catherine Lake. As it was announced yesterday or a couple days ago that Catherine Lake will drive the 51 for Dale Coin Racing this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway. Catherine Lake has made multiple oval starts so far. She drove at Iowa for Dale Coin Racing and, of course, ran in the Indianapolis 500. Catherine Lake, I think, is a very talented race car driver, and the field is going to be completely stacked this weekend, but I think Catherine Lake is a very good driver. I don't think she's going to be contending for the win by any stretch of imagination, but if there's a passing opportunity and we can see Dale Coin show the pace speed they've shown in the past, I could see her having a good, a good chance and opportunity to run extremely and very, very well. So I think she'll have a good chance and opportunity for a very solid performance and glad to see that she will get the chance and opportunity because I do think she actually will have the pace to speed to contend this weekend for maybe a top 10 or top 15. Yes, I'm being serious. I think she will be a threat and I think she'll be a contender for a pretty solid and great run this weekend at Royal Technology Raceway in IndyCar. 
And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about TRD. As we, it was basically, there's been a lot of talk about the engine issues that TRD and Joe Gibbs Racing in particular have been having. Well, Tyler Gibbs, who took over as a new TRD guy, basically said that what happened to Martin Truex Jr. is pretty much the same thing that happened to Christopher Bell at Gateway, where he had a valve spring issue at the end of the race. They said they are looking to correct this. They just recently are looking to hire a quality control manager, and they are looking to fix and correct these issues, and they apologize for all the engine issues that have been going on. It's really good to see Tyler Gibbs come out and say something about this because in all honesty and all seriousness, they need to get this resolved because we're really close to the playoffs at this point. And if they do not figure out what's going on with these engines and they don't resolve these engine issues, chances are one or two or three of their cars are all going to be eliminated from the playoffs. And I wouldn't be shocked or surprised this weekend at Michigan, whenever the race ends up happening, there wouldn't surprise or shock me if we see a, one of the JGR cars have an engine issue here because with how fast Michigan is, I think you could see an engine issue come up. So they need to get this figured out very, very quickly. Otherwise, if they're going to have drivers missing the playoffs and you can't have these issues going forward. So I'm really glad to see that they're looking to address the problems and issues because if they don't figure out this issue soon, there's a really great chance of possibility that they're going to end up missing the playoffs. And honestly, they probably weren't expecting that, but they may miss the playoffs if things don't get resolved for them very, very soon. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Noah Gregson. As it was confirmed on Wednesday and Thursday that Noah Gregson will drive a 30 for Red Jones Racing in the Xfinity Series this weekend at Michigan. This will be, I believe, the third and final schedule start for Noah Gregson in Xfinity. I don't think he's got another start schedule, if I remember correctly. Correct me on that. But Noah Gregson's made a couple starts so far for Red Jones Racing. In all honesty, he's been very, very competitive. At Charlotte, he finished in the top 10. And also at at, uh, Nashville, he finished in the top 10 and had a chance for a top 5 as well. I think Noah Grayson could be a surprise candidate to go out there and win this weekend. The 30 team also has SHR support, so they are going to have good pace and speed this weekend, where I think that if you're in a car like this, you'll have a great chance and an opportunity to be very, very competitive, especially if you have SHR equipment and you're getting big SHR support. So I think he's going to have a really great chance and an opportunity to be up front. I think the pace speed is going to be there for Noah, and I think Noah Grayson easy will have a great chance and an opportunity to at least get a top 10 this weekend for sure in Michigan, but I might have an outside chance to go out there and win this weekend as well. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Connor Daly. As it was announced on Wednesday early morning that Connor Daly will officially drive the 78 for Hunkos Hollinger Racing for this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway and for the remainder of the 2024 season. He's been rumored to be in the running to drive for this team for the remainder of the year. There was talk that Devin D. Francesco could make a couple select starts for the team, but they've decided to bring Connor Daly in for the remainder of the season. Connor Daly, say what you want to say. I think he is a talented race car driver. That's why a lot of these teams go after Connor Daly in the first place. Is because while Connor Daly may not be like an Alex Pelot level or even like a Scott Dix level or anything like that, we've seen Connor Daly put up some decent numbers throughout his career. And say what you want to say about Connor Daly, he's also a really good oval racer. And he will have a good chance and opportunity to be very competitive this weekend, especially if how fast 78 cars been at times when Augustine Canapino was behind the wheel. I really think Connor Daly will contend for a top 10. I think he will make that 78 car a lot better than how Augustine Canapino was making it. I think he will contend for a top 10, maybe even an outside chance in the top 5 this weekend as well. As the remainder of the year, I do think that there's a good chance he will be somewhat competitive on the road courses. I don't think he's going to be absolutely amazing, though we've seen Augustine run really well at the road courses at times. But I do think that Connor Daly will have a solid chance and opportunity to run very well. We'll see what ends up happening in regards to Connor Daly, see how he ends up doing for the remainder of the season. He'll be behind the wheel of a 78 car for the rest of the year. We do think that Devin D. Francesco is in the running to drive this car next year. We'll have to see if it ends up coming true for 2025. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Yuki Tsunoda. As it was reported by Motorsports.com yesterday that Yuki Tsunoda could be promoted to Red Bull in 2025 
if his performance continues to improve in Formula 1. Yuki Tsunoda, the last couple years in Formula 1, in my opinion, has been super impressive depending on where he's been running. He's had some really solid runs. He had a couple points finishes with them this year and generally has been outperforming Dan Ricciardo in certain areas. Now, obviously, he was not in the running to drive for Red Bull this year. Originally, Liam Lawson and Dan Ricciardo were two drivers that were considered takeover for Sergio Perez, but they made the decision to go ahead and keep Sergio behind the wheel of the Red Bull car for the remainder of the year, which I think was the right decision and right call. Call. Now, that being said, if Sergio Perez does continue to struggle, I think Yuki Tsunoda should be the lead candidate to get it. I like Liam Lawson. I like Daniel Ricciardo, but I don't want Daniel Ricciardo back over there. And Liam Lawson, I think he would be a good driver to go with. I think you need a younger driver over there. And Yuki is very, very young. Yuki's about my age, which is 24 years old. So I think it wouldn't be a bad decision to go ahead and move him over to Red Bull if he does end up showing a lot more pace and speed. We'll have to see if it ends up truly happening where he ends up going over to Red Bull next year. I still think there's a good chance Sergio is back with Red Bull next year. We'll have to wait and see his original contract was extended through 2026. But if Sergio does continue to struggle, I could see him losing his seat by the end of 2024 and could be on a move to another team in 2025. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Corey Day. As it was reported by Dirt Tracker during their podcast that Corey Day could be making some starts in the truck series later this year in the number seven truck for Spire Motorsports. Now that is very interesting. Corey Day obviously has made his couple select NASCAR Xfinity, but he hasn't made his Xfinity series start. But of course he's been driving part-time in ARCA this year, made his ARCA debut at Salem Speedway. Had a really good run going, was running inside the top three, was not going to catch William Sawash, but unfortunately ended up crashing out. Corey Day is one of the biggest standouts and one of the top 10 prospects, in my opinion, currently moving up through the ranks. And honestly, he's only ran a few pavement starts, but from what I've seen on pavement, he has been pretty good. If he gets a chance and an opportunity to drive the 7 truck for Spire by the end of this year, I really think that Corey Day could be very competitive. This 7 truck has shown some pretty good pace and speed. I know Connor Zillich didn't have a great finish at Richmond, but Connor was contending for a top 10 before they basically the caution of coming out. So I really would love to see what Corey Day can do. And I think if he gets a chance to drive the seven truck and you give him the crew chief, like of course, Brian Patty, I think he can absolutely get the best of it. So I'm really intrigued to see if this truly ends up happening because the fact it's being mentioned, it sounds like it's a very likely possibility. I really hope it ends up happening. And I hope that Corey Day does get the chance and opportunity to make some truck starts later this year with the team. So I do think he'll be very competitive. And I think he absolutely will be very fast in that seat in that car if he gets to drive the 7 truck. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brett Griffin. As it was confirmed yesterday that Brett Griffin will spot for Austin Dillon and Jesse Love this weekend at Michigan. We're going to talk about the penalty here in just a little bit, but remember it was announced that Brendan Benesh will be suspended for the next three races. And unlike the other side of the RCR appeal situation, we know that they have decided to go ahead and not defer, meaning that Brendan Benesh will begin to serve his suspension as a, as a spotter. Brett Griffin, of course, a veteran spotter who's had a lot of controversy, obviously, but he's been working at RCR this year. He's been spotting for the number 33 car and also spots for the number two car in the Xfinity series for Jesse Love. Brett Griffin, I think, is a good spotter, but honestly, in all seriousness, I know he's been saying a lot of things. He thinks that Austin Dillon shouldn't have been penalized for what happened, which I completely disagree. But I think you basically, of course, when you work for a team, you're not going to want to say stuff that's going to piss off your owner, right? Because Richard's someone that can, you can, don't want to make mad. That being said, I think Brett is a decent, is a good spotter, in my opinion. He's won races with Clint Boyer, of course, won race this year with Jesse Love. I think he's a good spotter for sure. But I don't agree with all the controversy that Brett has said on his podcast, especially. And I wish sometimes Brett would keep his mouth shut so he doesn't get in trouble with a lot of people. So honestly, I'm not though surprised or shocked to see that he'll be spotting for them this weekend at Michigan. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Aaron Kramer. As it was announced yesterday afternoon that Aaron Kramer will be the crew chief for Cole Custer in the NASCAR Cup Series in 2025 
on the number 41 car. Aaron Kramer, for those who don't know, is the current lead engineer for Chris Buescher in the NASCAR Cup Series and has been the lead engineer for Chris Buescher, I believe, since 2023. This definitely is a little bit shocking because I really thought that Jonathan Tony was going to be the crew chief for Cole Custer considering they've had a really good working relationship in the NASCAR Xfinity Series for many, many years. I'm a little shocked to see he's not moving up the crew chief. But at the same token, at the same time, it does make a lot of sense considering the fact that we know the Haas factory team will be working with RFK Racing next year in a pretty big and massive way. I think this is a really, really great move. We've seen a lot of success from him, but I don't believe that Aaron Kramer has ever had any crew chiefing experience. So this will be the first time that we do get to see him be a crew chief this next year. But I do think if anyone could really help out Cole Custer, who I think, which by the way, I think Cole Custer has gotten so much better as a driver over the course of the last few years, especially since getting back down to Xfinity, I think it's definitely Aaron Kramer. So we'll see how he ends up doing next year with Aaron Kramer, that being Cole Custer. I think there's going to be some struggles for sure next year for the team and organization, but nonetheless, it's pretty exciting to see, and I'm glad to see that we officially know who the crew chief is going to be for Cole Custer next year. There'll be other announcements in regards to this team in the future, sponsorship on other things, but I'm glad to see at least we know for sure who the crew chief is going to be for Cole Custer in 2025. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kevin Harvick. Now, earlier this week on the Happy Hour podcast that Kevin Harvick runs on Fox, Kevin Harvick says that he is planning to expand his racing schedule in 2025 to around 14 to 15 races for next year. Kevin Hart basically said that the racing itch has not really gotten away. He said that he didn't just want to run that one off start at North Wilkesboro in the number 62 car for his own organization. He wants to make more starts in the car store potentially. He also might want to make some more late model starts in other series as well. Now, we did not mention the possibility of returning to NASCAR, but when you hear 14 and 15 races, I'd have to imagine that Kevin Harvick is talking a little bit about NASCAR as well. Now, Kevin Harvick has said publicly in the past that he's open to maybe running some Xfinity Series starts and some Truck Series starts as well. It'd be pretty cool to see Kevin Harvick incorporate potentially come back but you look at what Kevin Harvick did, he actually had pretty good pace and speed in the car store race, had top 10 and top 15 speed, and I believe he got a top 10 as well. And Kevin Harvick, despite him not retiring, he's still someone who wants to go out there and compete. And I really hope that Kevin Harvick does get the chance and opportunity to compete in some more car store races next year. And I would love to see him come back and do a one-off or two-off in the NASCAR Xfinity and Cups in Truck Series wall. He's obviously not going to come ever back and run a Cup race, in my opinion, because he'll be 50 next year at the end of the year. But I do think Kevin Harvick running in the Truck Series and Xfinity Series, I think it'd be very, very fun because he did have a lot of success here. So it's pretty cool to see this for sure, that Kevin is going to run some more races next year, and it's pretty exciting stuff. And glad to see that Kevin will get the chance and opportunity to make some more starts in NASCAR, not NASCAR, but in some other forms of racing in 2025. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Iowa Speedway. As it was reported by Connor Ferguson, who does a lot of work for some big companies, like Always Race Day, that it looks like Iowa Speedway will be moving their NASCAR weekend to later in the year. According to some of the renewal dates that have been coming out, it looks like Iowa Speedway weekend will be moving to the first weekend of August on August 3rd of 2025. Iowa Speedway for 2024 was on Father's Day, so we'll be pushing back quite a bit. There are expected to be a lot of schedule changes for 2025, as there was a schedule leak that came out not too long ago, and it seems like that schedule leak that's been being reported might actually be getting, starting to become a little bit true. Now, obviously, Iowa Speedway moving to a little bit earlier and later in the year to August was very interesting is that number one that likely will be the first weekend that NBC will begin hosting NASCAR race again because remember TNT will go before them and then of course Amazon will happen before them and then Fox of course will begin but the other big interesting thing is that is the weekend of the Knoxville Nationals which is very interesting to me now some people from the Knoxville area are not going to be really happy about this because they're going to have a little bit on their home turf but at same token same time I don't think this is a bad decision to move to have the Iowa weekend around the Knoxville Nationals weekend because it will let people know that they're going to be able to have a chance and opportunity to go to Knoxville and then, of course, go and watch the NASCAR Cup Series racing, which I think Knoxville put on a pretty okay show that Kyle Larson dominated. But I do think having Iowa and Knoxville, because they're both, of course, in the same state, having them both happen on the same weekend 
is very interesting to look at for sure. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in regards to see if this officially ends up coming true with Iowa Speedway hosting the NASCAR Cup Series weekend in the first week of August. But the fact that it's starting to come out, it can't be denied at this point. I do think that Iowa Speedway will officially be hosting the NASCAR Cup Series on the first weekend of August. I think that's going to end up happening. We're still waiting for the schedule to be released at this point, but I do think the schedule is coming soon, and the more information comes out, the more than likely the schedule will be released in the not-so-distance future, and I think it is coming very, very soon. And now we're going to go ahead, jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Denny Hamlin. Now, I believe Chris Gabar was on Sirius and NASCAR Radio yesterday, and he says that Denny Hamlin's hit at Richmond after Austin Dillon right reared him down the straightaway. He says his crash hit at Richmond was, 32, was a 32G spike, which is the highest G load ever. That is even harder than Kurt Busch's hit that he had at Pocono two years ago. That is absolutely insane. And that's probably one of the big other reasons why we saw a penalty come out for Austin Dillon. The fact that people defended Austin Dillon even after how huge of a hit he had, not which could have resulted in a concussion, by the way, with how big of a hit that was, which shows these cars have gotten a little safer over the last year or so. But number two, Denny Hamlin actually was complaining about shoulder pain. He basically said his shoulder got popped out after the race, which is honestly insane that people would defend it. And honestly, I don't care how you feel about it. The fact that what Austin Dillon did was still unacceptable and a driver could have gotten seriously hurt here. And I just don't understand how you defend right rearing somebody down the straightaway. And that's why I'm a little also surprised why Austin Dillon did not receive a suspension for the contact here. Because in my opinion, right rearing somebody down the straightaway, I don't care what side, the size of the track is, which I think that's what NASCAR went in. They probably thought because it was a short track, that probably shouldn't have been a suspension. But I completely disagree. I think it should have been a suspension, in all honesty, because right rearing somebody down the straightaway is completely unacceptable and completely uncalled for. So that hit is insane to me. It's absolutely wild that 32 Gs was that hit. And it kind of questions, why was he not suspended for that hit? I'm a little surprised that he wasn't for the pit and the contact. So, honestly, very crazy stuff to hear for sure. It's crazy that that hit, which didn't look as hard, it was 32 Gs. That was a massive hit and massive serious contact. And I'm glad to see Denny Hamill's okay. It looks like he will be racing this weekend. No chances to the driver. I don't think there's a relief driver coming as well. So, Denny Hamlin, as of now, isn't losing his seat for the weekend. And hoping Denny Hamlin is all good going forward. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Richard Childress Racing. As it was announced yesterday and reported by Davey Siegel that Richard Childress Racing will have a team announcement on Sunday at 11.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at Michigan International Speedway. Now, there's a lot of potential possibilities in regards to a team announcement. I look at three major possibilities. Number one, it could be them just announcing out of nowhere that Kyle Busch could be leaving RCR at the end of the year to go to Spire Motorsports potentially, but I don't think that is the most likely option. The second possibility is maybe they're going to talk about the penalties among other things, but I don't think that is what is going to happen. If you want my, my prediction on what's going to be happening, my prediction is, is that they are going to be announcing that Greg Zipidelli is going to be the competition director for RCR starting in 2025. There's been a lot of rumors and chatter from some people in the industry that Greg Zipidelli will be leaving SHR and the Haas team altogether and will be joining up with RCR next year. There's even been rumors he's already been working out at there at the moment. Greg Zipidelli has been in NASCAR for a very, very long time and RCR has been looking to try to get better. While Greg Zipidelli probably was good a couple years ago, he's still someone who is recognized by a lot of people. And if he can go to a new team and gel with them very, very quickly and have a lot of success, I think that is going to be good for everybody because we know RCR has been struggling. Granted, they did get that win at Richmond, but still having a situation like this where you've been struggling as bad as this organization has been struggling, I really, really hope that they can get a lot better. So I'm hoping for their sake that's what it is. It could be something else. We don't know. Maybe they're going to announce Austin Hills back in the 21 car next year. That could be a potential possibility as well. They could be announcing that rumor merger of Colleg and RCR. There's been a rumor about that. But I don't think that's what it's going to be. If Again, if you want my prediction, I think RCR is going to be announcing the competition director. That's my prediction. I think Greg Zipidelli will be officially headed over there. I think that's what is officially going to be happening for 2025. I think that's what is going to end up being officially announced. 
And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Front Row Motorsports. As it was reported by Breakheart, fellow motorsports YouTuber, that Front Row Motorsports is close to announcing their final driver for 2025. And he says that Front Row Motorsports news is coming very, very soon. Now, what could this news be? Like I mentioned a second ago, they are very, very close to announcing their third driver for 2025. They already announced that Noah Grace will be driving one of the seats for next year about a month ago. And we know that Todd Gillen signed a multi-year contract extension with the team. Same for Noah Grace, who has a multi-year deal to drive for Front Row Motorsports. So they are expected to get a third car. We know that they're going to have a third charter next year. So who is going to be in this third car for 2025? Well, there's three drivers in the running. The first one is Zane Smith, the second one is Sam Mayer, and the third one is Chandler Smith. Chandler Smith is a new name that jumped up about a week or so ago considering the fact that he will not be back at Joe Gibbs Racing next year in Xfinity as they're expected to have an all-new lineup for 2025. Chandler Smith, I think, is the least likely driver to go here. I think most likely he is going to remain in the NASCAR Xfinity Series next year. So I think it comes down between Sam Mayer and Zane Smith. Now, there's some upside to both these drivers. They're both very young. They're both very talented, and they do have a lot of potential. Now, Sam Mayer has been linked to some Xfinity Series teams and a team we're going to get to here in just a little bit. I think Sam is less likely than Zane Smith, unfortunately. I know there were rumors about Sam Mayer potentially going to Front Row Motorsports for 2025, but I think that has changed. I think the third driver at this team next year is going to be Zane Smith. I think Zane Smith is going to end up being the driver at front row. He's been the new lead candidate for a while now. And I think that Zane Smith, despite the fact that he kind of is trying to struggle this fire, he had a lot of success at front row, especially in the truck series. So I think going back over to front row, where he did have a lot of success, I think is a really good and great decision if you're looking to get a lot better. And I do believe that Zane Smith has shown a lot of improvement over the last month or so. He's been faster than Corey LaJoy, and he's had some good runs. He had a top 20 average the last five or six races. They're showing a lot more pace and speed, and I think that's why he'll end up over there next year at front row. And I think he'll be doing a lot better. So my prediction for next year's lineup, again, I think it will be next year the lineup for front row. Noah Grayson in the 34 car, Zane Smith in the 36, and Todd Gill in the 38, unless, of course, they decide to buy out some of the SHR numbers like the 4 and the 10, and they bring that over, which, again, is certainly a possibility for next year. But I do think for 2025, it is going to be Zane Smith who's going to get the third C. I think Chandler Smith may end up in Xfinity like JRM or something like that or Colin. And then, of course, Sam Mayer. He's going to be probably going to a team that we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. I think that's where he ends up in 2025. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about AJ Allmendinger. Now, we already talked about this on the channel yesterday in a special video, but it was announced yesterday that AJ Allmendinger will be, in fact, returning to the NASCAR Cup Series full-time in 2025, driving a number 16 car for Colleg Racing. There have been rumors and speculation about this being a potential possibility where AJ was going to be going back up to the NASCAR Cup Series. Bob had noted that about a week or so ago, and rumors began to become rampant that he was, in fact, going to be making the move back up for 2025. I think this is a really great decision for Call of Racing to move him up. Now, they did not announce who the crew chief is going to be and what sponsors are going to be with AJ, but my guess is all the sponsors that have been with him, Actions Industries, Celsius, and all the other companies that have worked at Call of Racing, I believe that they'll be working with AJ Allmendinger once again next season. AJ Allmendinger, in my opinion, is a cup-level driver, and while he has struggled in the Xfinity Series this year for his standards, he still has had some pretty solid numbers, all things considered. And in the Cup Series, in the select races that he has ran, he has been very, very competitive. And one other reason why I think this is a really great move for Call of Race and moving back up full-time to the Cup Series next year is because there's stability in that car. I think having one driver compared to having a rotation car, having drivers like Shane Van Gisberg and Ty Dillon and AJ to drive this car and Josh Williams, having a rotation lineup, you're not able to get a chance and opportunity to learn and make those cars better. Having a consistent driver behind the wheel of this seat, you're going to get that chance and opportunity to make that car a lot faster by having one consistent driver behind the wheel. So I do expect that this car will be a lot more competitive in 2025 compared to where it was this year. It's had a couple good runs, but AJ's been very competitive in the seat. 
If you want my prediction, I think AJ will have a chance to make the playoffs, and it wouldn't surprise or shock me by the end of 2025 if he does end up winning at least a race or two, because I think their road course program, say what you want to say, their road course program has shown a lot more pace and speed. Now, what does this mean for the Xfinity Series program? Well, I think his replacement is going to end up being Christian Eckes. We know their Xfinity lineup is going to be very different next year. They're expected to have three to four cars potentially next year. And Christian Eckes has been heavily linked and rumored to joining college racing for the last couple of years. He nearly actually went to the 11 car for 2024, but obviously stayed in the truck series for one more year. But Christian's been tearing it up in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series this year. So I think he's earned the right and opportunity to make the move back up to the NASCAR Xfinity Series to get the chance to go Xfinity Racing because I think Christian is a very talented driver. He's got a lot of potential, one of the best young prospects, and I think if you put him behind the wheel of this seat for next year, I think he'll be super quick and super competitive. We don't know what the rest of the lineup is going to look like. We do know there's rumors about Ty Dillon potentially going to 31 car. There's rumors about Daniel Hamrick maybe coming back to the 31 car next year, and there's a chance Daniel Hamrick or Ty Dillon could end up in the Xfinity program for college racing next year. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in regards to that and see how much competitive competitiveness comes out from that. But I do believe that next year they are going to be pretty competitive. And I think it's a really good move to go ahead and do this and move AJ back up the cup. Because I do think AJ will be pretty solid and will have some pretty good pace and speed next year on those types of tracks. I expect a pretty good season for AJ Allmendinger in 2025. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Austin Dillon once again. Now, I did a video discussing this on the channel of yesterday or a couple days ago, but remember, it was announced that Austin Dillon is no longer in the playoffs at this particular moment. After what he did at Richmond, right rear and Denny Hamill down the straightaway and moving Joe Logano up the racetrack and quintessentially wrecking him, Austin Dillon is no longer in the playoffs and his playoff eligibility has been officially revoked. Also, Brandon Benesh, like I mentioned earlier, was suspended for three races, and he lost 25 driver and owner's points. Now, since that time when we did this video, Richard Jost Racing confirmed that they are planning to appeal the penalties that ended up happening. They said they were disappointed with NASCAR's decision, and they basically said that they are going to appeal it. Now, while the, we don't know exactly when the appeal date is going to end up happening, we do think it's going to happen for the playoffs, which is about two and a half weeks from now. Considering Southern 500 is about two weeks, I imagine that they're going to have a chance to appeal that within the next week or so. Now, let me ask you all this. Do you, I might ask you all this, but what do you think? I Do I think that they are going to win this appeal? No, I don't think they really have a chance and opportunity. There's only maybe like a 5% chance, and maybe the only chance they have is because it's unprecedented where they have done this before. But NASCAR has so much data to back this up. They have s &T data. They have radio and spotter communication. They have all the other things that basically go against Richard Charles Racing's argument. So I don't think that they are going to win the appeal. Not to mention, they could add more stuff on here. We've seen NASCAR make these penalties worse. We could see them, for all we know, at a one-race suspension. And basically said, yeah, we're going to go ahead and take that win away from you, or a one-race suspension. And honestly, I think looking at the penalty report, I feel like a one-race suspension for Austin Dillon might have been in order here. Because he right rear Denny Hamill down the straightaway. I say I get people don't like Denny Hamill. It's fine and understandable. But right rearing somebody down the straightaway is just not acceptable. Especially with all the data that came out from that. Man, like... Honestly, ridiculous that people defend this. And I know people say, well, Dale Earnhardt did it. Well, Dale Earnhardt wasn't loved for it. By the way, he got a fine in 1986 at Richmond, didn't win the race, mind you, had a $5,000 fine, which is equivalent to 14.5K now, and had to pay a $10,000 fine or a bond to go to the next race. And then in 1999, he was booed for what he did. So I don't know why people love this kind of stuff right rear it. If he didn't right rear Denny Hamill down the straightaway, he probably doesn't get a penalty for this. But NASCAR saw all the data and saw the stuff that ended up happening, and they had to penalize Austin Dillon for it. And honestly, I think they made the right call. I don't expect him to appeal the penalty, to be honest. And we'll probably talk more about this this weekend once more stuff comes out. But we're not expecting him to win. I don't think Austin Dillon is going to win. So he doesn't really have any ground to stand on, unfortunately. There's really nothing to stand on. I don't think Austin Dillon is going to win this appeal, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Larson. Now, there's always been this discussion in motorsports about who is a better driver, Max Verstappen 
or Kyle Larson. And many people have said that Kyle Larson is all around a driver. But we haven't heard one of these drivers say they're better than the other until a couple days ago. After Kyle Larson won the 2024 Knoxville Nationals for the second consecutive year, leading every single lap for the second consecutive year as well, Kyle Larson finally says something about it. He says that he is a better all-around driver than Max Verstappen. He says there's no way that Verstappen could get into a sprint car and or wing midget car and be successful. He also knows he said he can't go to Bristol and win there. He couldn't go to other forms and win there. Larson says he probably couldn't get into an Indy, like an F1 car and go to Monaco and be successful, but he probably could get up to speed a lot more quicker than Max Verstappen. He says he might beat him in F1 in IndyCar discipline, but it's almost like the same discipline, which Kyle Larson is kind of right about that. Yes, IndyCar and F1 are two different disciplines, but they're kind of like the same discipline because they're both open wheel. Now, Kyle Larson, when I read this, a lot of you are asking me, is Kyle Larson right? Yeah, I I don't think Kyle Larson is actually wrong about what he said. Look, is Max Verstappen a fantastic Formula One driver? Absolutely. There's no argument. There's no denying that. Max is probably one of the greatest, if arguably the greatest F1 drivers we have ever seen in the last few years. But Max Verstappen has not competed in anything else outside of Formula One and karting. Kyle Larson has competed in the NASCAR Cup Series, 27 NASCAR Cup Series wins, five road course wins, mind you, and also has a NASCAR Cup Series championship. He won the Rolex 24 in 2015, had nine of the top 15 fastest laps of the event. At the age of 22, by the way, he has won the Kings Royal, the Chili Bowl Nationals two or three times. He has won the Knoxville Nationals three times. He has won a lot of big events. He's won the Prairie Dirt Classic. He's gotten in the quarter midget, not quarter midgets. He's gotten into sprint car midgets, 410 sprint cars, 360 sprint cars, has been in other series. He won the Rookie of the Year for the Indy 500 and had a chance to win the Indy 500 earlier this year. So in my opinion, when you look at it, it's a no-brainer. Kyle Larson is a better all-around driver. Now, I would love to see both of these guys go up against each other one day, and get the chance and opportunity to race. Again, I think Larson is all around a better race car driver than Max Verstappen. Again, Max Verstappen, I saw a lot of F1 fans using ignorance and basically saying that Max Verstappen's better. And just for the record, I want to tell everybody, just because you're not in Formula 1, which is considered the pinnacle of motorsport, doesn't mean you're a bad driver. You're telling me that Kyle Larson is worse than Logan Sargent? You're telling me that he's worse than Lance Stroll? You're telling me he's worse than Nikita Mazepin was? Lance Stroll wrecks a ton of cars. Logan Sargent, I like Logan Sargent. I'm glad he's going to be headed over to IndyCar more than likely. But let's be real. Logan Sargent is not better than Kyle Larson. I think he would admit that. And Max Verstappen probably has to look at it and said, yeah, Larson's got a better pedigree and has a better racing resume. That's just the fact. Kyle Larson has a better racing resume, and I really hope one day we do get to see Kyle Larson run an F1 car, and if you drop him in a Red Bull car, I think he'd be very, very competitive. So yes, I agree 100%. Kyle Larson is a better all-around driver than Max Verstappen. That's not saying Max is a worse driver than Larson, but sure it's imagination. I think you also need to mention Shane Van Gisbergen as a driver who's absolutely very, very good as well. Nonetheless, I think Larson is absolutely on the money. He's absolutely correct. And I think Larson 100% is right about the fact that he is a better all-around driver. I know some will disagree, and that's fine and understandable. But I do believe that Kyle Larson is honestly an all-around better driver than Max Verstappen, to be honest with you. And now we're going to head jump on to the first of three major stories in today's episode as we're talking about RFK Racing and Kroger. As it was reported by Adam Stern last night, that RFK Racing is being tipped as the likely landing spot for Kroger's NASCAR sponsorship next year. And according to another report, some execs wonder whether it could allow RFK to expand to three cars. They also mentioned that Ryan Priest could be a potential candidate for a third RFK Racing seat for 2025. This definitely shocked me when I saw this report last night because we talked about this a couple months ago. We know that Kroger is expected to leave JTG Doherty Racing at the end of this year, and Tad and Jody Koscheckter are expected to not be part of the JTG Doherty organization for 2025. We all originally thought, though, that they were going to be going over to work with Joe Gibbs Racing, considering the fact they've had a working relationship with Joe Gibbs Racing for basically the last year or so. But... 
the fact that they're looking to go to RFK is very interesting as they're looking to go to like the Fenway Sports Group brand. Kroger is worth a lot of money and this would absolutely be massive and very huge for a lot of reasons. It'd be more cash flow for RFK and like we mentioned, possibility of a third charter. This could lead them to potentially getting a third charter from Sewer Haas Racing. Now, obviously, we know some organizations that are expected to pick up charters from Sewer Haas Racing. We know Front Row's gotten one. We know Haas Factory Team's gotten one for Cole Custer. We know the two teams that have been heavily linked to those, one of them being 2311 Racing. We know Riley Herbst is the favorite for the third 2311 Racing C. We know Bubba Walls is also expected to sign a multi-year contract extension with the team as well in the future. We also know that there's been drivers like Carl Edwards rumored at points as well. And then, of course, you do have Corey Heim has been linked to the seats as well. And then, of course, Trackhouse Racing, they've been heavily linking Shane Van Gisbergen is the expected driver who is going to get the third Trackhouse Racing seat for 2025. But going back to RFK Racing, they're now in the conversations for a third charter, which is very interesting with Kroger going in. Now, obviously, they mentioned Ryan Priest as a possibility. Ryan Priest obviously is the final SHR driver that currently does not have a seat at the moment for 2025. We know that Josh Berry is going to the Wood Brothers driving a 21 car. Chase Briscoe is going to Joe Gibbs Racing next year. And Noah Grayson, of course, is going to Front Row Motorsports. So Sue Driver, same with Ford, and one same with Toyota. Ryan Priest, I know some will say that he doesn't deserve this chance and opportunity. But let's be real frank and honest. Say what you want to say about Ryan Priest. Ryan Priest is a talented race car driver. The guy won multiple Xfinity Series races, has multiple Truck Series wins. He just hasn't been in the best of situations in the NASCAR Cup Series. Did no disrespect, but the 41 car has been the worst SHR car since Kurt Busch left the team in 2018. And he drove for JTG in an unchartered car, which wasn't getting as much support and wasn't getting as much funding and wasn't getting as much money to really help that program in that car. So I think him over at RFK would be very interesting if he would, in fact, end up going there. Who could be some other candidates? Well, of course, Justin Haley is another driver who obviously could end up over at the scene next year. We know they like Justin Haley, but there's been a lot of chatter and there's been a lot of rumors and there's been a lot of rumblings that Justin Haley could potentially be headed over next year to Spire Motorsports to drive the 7 car. He's the lead candidate at this particular moment to drive the number 7 car for Spire Motorsports next year. So I think he could end up over there in 2025, which I think would be a very interesting move. Who else could you get? Maybe Matt Benedetto. I know some maybe say I'd probably get someone saying Haley Deegan, but no, Haley Deegan is not going to probably be at this team next year. It's going to be very interesting to see who they actually decide to get behind the wheel of this third car if they do expand to a third car. If they don't expand to another car and have the extra cash flow to make both their other cars better, that would be absolutely huge. But having a potential possibility of Kroger coming in and working with the team is actually a really huge deal, all things considered. And I think it's a massive and a major, major deal. So I really hope this does end up happening where Kroger finds their way over there because I think Kroger going over and working with them. Now they could still end up over at Joe Gibbs Racing. That could certainly be a possibility. But I think what's also huge about this is apparently they probably offer Ricky Sandhouse Jr. an opportunity to go over there. And imagine if we see JTG switch to four and they get alliance with RFK Racing. That would be very interesting. That'd be one less car for Chevy to deal with and four would be having another competitive ride and maybe Ricky Sandhouse Jr. finds his way back over to Ford and maybe just maybe we see kind of that. That's how they get their way in. That will be very, very interesting. But still, pretty huge to see that RFK Racing is looking to get another sponsorship with Kroger, and they are looking to expand. It's pretty huge and pretty cool to see that it looks like Kroger has found their new place for 2025, and it looks like they're going to be headed over to RFK Racing in the 2025 NASCAR Cup Series season. Pretty huge overall. It looks like they're headed over to Kroger. Kroger's headed over to RFK in 2025. And now we're going to head jump on to the next major story in today's episode as we're talking about Kurt Busch. As it unfortunately was confirmed this past week that Kurt Busch was sadly arrested earlier this week on Monday evening or Tuesday evening. It was reported that Kurt Busch was arrested for a DWI, which is driving while intoxicated and reckless driving and also speeding as well. Now, Kurt Busch did release an apology in regards to the situation, saying that he's disappointed with his actions. He says that he'll be working with the community, the Iredale community, everybody in the community, and the police. He's cooperating with police this time around and says that he will work with the community to make these roads a lot safer. 
This is a very unfortunate situation, very serious, obviously. Uh, Kurt Busch, obviously, we all know that there's he's been, uh, this is not the first time that Kurt Busch, I believe, has been arrested for something like this back in 2005. He was basically pulled over by an officer, I believe in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken, right before the NASCAR Cup Series weekend at Phoenix, and lost his ride with Roush. Now, 2311 Racing has not commented on the situation at this time, and NASCAR has not made a comment on it as well, whether they are going to suspend Kurt Busch or not. I imagine there is a chance that that could be coming down the pipeline, but maybe not because Kurt Busch isn't a driver, so that might not be why he has been suspended. Look, Kurt Busch's public image prior to this situation has continued to improve and was improving. A lot of people, from what I know, they interact with Kurt Busch, and Kurt Busch is very friendly to a lot of people. But unfortunately, this situation is going to hurt his public image. Number one, I really hope Kurt gets the help he needs in this situation. Kurt's been through a lot the last couple of years. He obviously had, went through a divorce a couple of years ago with his former uh, girlfriend or wife, Ashley. And then, of course, he unfortunately had the divorce situation. And then, of course, he lost. Basically, his career kind of came to an end. There were rumors about him coming back earlier this year. But his career kind of came to an end abruptly after the crash and never really got the chance and opportunity to come back. And I really think that has unfortunately affected him in a very negative way. There is no excuse for something like this, though. They have Uber, man. Like, you gotta, you gotta get that and stuff. I, again, I really hope for Kurt's sake he does get the help he needs. And I really hope that this doesn't hurt Kurt's public image because I think Kurt has really gotten better as a person. Back when Kurt Busch was a lot younger in the early 2000s, Kurt Busch was kind of an a-hole. He wasn't the nicest person in the world. But Kurt Busch is someone that a lot of people have said has improved with a lot of people and it made a lot of people happy. And what he's done for 2311 Racing, helping that organization, seeing Bubba Walls helping him grow as a driver, seeing Tyler Reddick grow as a driver over there, and being a guy that kind of helped push him. And what he did as a race car driver on the racetrack and the potential of him being a Hall of Famer very soon is really, really huge. I hope for Kurt's sake he does get the help he needs and he gets better. And again, it's good to see that Kurt at least admitted that he screwed up, which is absolutely the most important thing, is admit from your mistakes and learn from them and get better. And don't do this stuff again. He's had and this, again, his BAC was 0.17, which is twice above the legal limit, mind you. And, of course, the other side of this is the fact that Kurt Busch was driving over the limit. He was like 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. You can't do that. you got to be a lot better as a person in these situations. And that's why I tell people, be careful. And one thing is that there's Uber. Basically, if you're feeling like you're like that, call somebody. Tell somebody to pick you up. Don't be driving and doing that kind of stuff. It's just not a good look on Kurt's end. Again, I hope for Kurt's sake that he is able to recover from this and get better from a situation like this because it's a very serious situation, very tragic in all honesty and all seriousness to how this kind of happened, unfortunately. And I, again, there's no excuse for what happened. Kurt should absolutely know better about this. He knows he's disappointed. And I hope that for his sake, he does get better from the situation and learns from the situation. Because in my opinion, something like this is not something to joke about. Again, I hope for Kurt's sake, he can learn from this. He can grow from this as a person. Again, I hope he can because he's working with the community to try to make the place a lot safer, which is the most important thing in my opinion, is trying to go out there and make the community as safe as possible so something like this never ends up happening again. I hope Kirk can learn from this and grow from this situation, and we now can move on from this situation because it's a really sad situation overall, and I really hope Kirk can learn from this situation here very, very soon, in my honest opinion. I hope he can learn from the situation and grow from it. And now we're going to head on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about the Haas factory team. As has been reported by multiple reports, the Haas factory team will officially announce their 2025 NASCAR Xfinity Series lineup this Saturday at 11.30 Eastern Standard Time. Now, there was no drivers that were indicated in the reports, but Haas factory team's Xfinity program will have two NASCAR Xfinity Series rides for 2025. We already know that Cole Custer will be in the Cup Series in the number 41 car next year, and we are not expecting that Riley Hertz is going to be one of those drivers. So now the big question is going to be, who are the two drivers that are going to be behind the wheel? I looked at a Couch Racer tweet, and it's very interesting on who the drivers behind the wheel. Originally, my prediction was, was that it was going to be Ryan Priest and Haley Deegan who were going to get the seats. But it looks like things have changed. According to Couch Racer, which is run by Brett Griffin and Freddie Kraft and multiple people over at Door Bumper Claire, they're saying that the drivers that will not be part of this, one of them is not Haley Deegan. 
Haley Deegan, like I mentioned, had been rumored as a potential candidate, and apparently Haas Factory had talked to her, but it looks like she will not be behind the wheel of this car. This does not shock me or surprise me, all things considered. Look, Haley Deegan does have a little bit of sponsorship with her. Not a ton, but she does have a slight little bit of sponsorship with her, but not as much as other drivers that are looking. And let's be real and honest, Haley Deegan, I think, would have struggled a little bit. I think she would have done a little better than what she did at AM Racing, but she probably was going to not have a really great chance and opportunity to make the playoffs. Do I think working with a team like Haas Factory Team, one of the top tier teams, would have been a really great move for her? So I, while I'm disappointed to see that for her, I do think she will find a ride for NASCAR next year. Another name not mentioned was Ryan Priest. Sounds like Ryan Priest is not going here because he couldn't end up at Rick Ware next year. He couldn't end up in a really good team in Cup or couldn't end up at RFK if they do get a third charter. But Ryan Priest, I thought for sure was going to be one of the drivers. And then the other driver that I thought maybe was Chandler Smith. But Chandler Smith, according to Couch Racer, is also not going to be there in 2025. So who could that be some candidates? Harrison Burton? Harrison Burton definitely could be a surprise candidate. He's got sponsorship from Dex Imaging, and he's been a driver that I think a lot of us have kind of heard as a potential candidate to go over to this team. But I've also heard AM Racing is a potential possibility for Harrison Burton next year. So I don't know if he's going to end up there in 2025. I don't know if he ends up there, but he couldn't end up there. But the two drivers that I've seen people mentioning are Sheldon Creed and Sam Mayer. Let's first begin with Sam Mayer. If you look at that Couch Racer tweet, the way they align that tweet it shows M-A-Y-E-R, Mayer. Sam Mayer, obviously, there's been rumors about where he's going to go. There's rumors he's not going to be back at Junior Motorsports in 2025. And Sam Mayer obviously does have a lot of talent. He wants to go to NASCAR Cup Series. There have been rumors about him going to Front Row Motorsports, but it sounds like Zane Smith is going to end up getting the seat for 2025. And Sam Mayer, in my opinion, saying another year in Xfinity is not a bad move. Now, I think Sam Mayer is going to struggle over Haas Factory next year because he's been good in Xfinity, but he's been with Junior Motorsports in the Chevy camp for a very, very long time. It is going to be a big loss for Chevy if Sam Mayer truly goes over there next year. But at the same token, same point, in same time, if you want to get the chance and opportunity to move up the cup, there are some four rides in the near future that are going to be available. Brad Keselowski ain't going to be around forever. We don't know how much longer Chris Buescher is going to be in RFK. We don't know how much longer other drivers like Joey Logano are going to be around, and Austin Sindrick as well, though we know Sindrick is going to be in the two-car next year. That got confirmed recently. But I could see Sam Mayer doing very, very well next year if he does go to Haas Factory. The other driver that we do believe will be in there is Sheldon Creed. Sheldon Creed has a lot of sponsorship in funding with him. His grandfather has been funding his career. And Sheldon Creed has been the first driver that we kind of knew at this point over the last week or so. Door Bumper Claire had mentioned this on their podcast. Brett Griffin and Freddie Kraft had mentioned it on the podcast. The day we're expecting that Sheldon Creed was going to end up over here in 2025. Sheldon Creed, I think, is a talented race car driver. Is he like the greatest driver in the world? No, not for sure. But I think Sheldon Creed is a talented driver. That being said, he is still looking for his first Xfinity Series win. And I think Sheldon Creed will do solid. Do I think he's going to win a race? I don't know at this point because we keep saying he's going to win wherever he goes. He couldn't win with the RCR. Got a lot of runner-up finishes. He came close to winning. He sounded like he was very, very unlucky. But he couldn't win at RCR. He hasn't been able to win at Joe Gibbs. Granted, they've had a lot of electrical issues and electrical gremlins that have affected him in a pretty massive and major and big way. But I think they're going over to Haas and working maybe Jonathan Tony. Maybe that's a chance and opportunity. We've seen their program get better over there. SHR's big program, especially, has been fast. And he basically might be taking over the double zero card next year, which I think that he will be an outside championship contender. And I think he might finally, potentially, get that first career win in Xfinity. He's been getting. But I don't think Sheldon Creed is a bad driver. Sheldon has a lot of talent. He has a lot of potential. He's shown it in the past. And I think he's got a lot of potential in the world to be very competitive and be up front on a week-by-week basis. So I think Sheldon Creed over at Haas Factory would be a very interesting move. Now, do I expect him to absolutely set the world on fire? No, absolutely not. But I think Sheldon Creed is a talented race car driver. He can sometimes get the best out of equipment for sure. And I do think he will end up over here in 2025. I think the fact that it's been talked about by multiple different sources, Candace Spencer and Cal Trader's Shop and Dora Bumper Claire have been saying it and the sponsorship he brings. I think he ends up over here next year. Again, that announcement will come tomorrow. And once that announcement does officially come out, we'll discuss it live here on the channel. So that is good for today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. 
Please like, subscribe to the channel, turn notifications on, so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Let's go to more of that and comment below your thoughts below on today's episode. Do you think Sheldon Creed truly ends up here next year? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And what are thoughts about Kurt Busch unfortunately being arrested? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, we're going to have a lot of content dropping. We're obviously going to have a report on the Haas Factory team. If the Xfinity and Cup races do happen this weekend, we'll discuss them here on the channel. And we got a lot of great content dropping as we get closer to plus with Daytona being next weekend as well. We got a lot of great content that I can't wait for you guys to check out. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode. And I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.